And when I felt like God could fix this, and yet He was choosing not to. That's hard. You see, we serve a really good God. Yeah. But we also serve a really good God who does allow hurt. And that's at that point where our feelings and our faith come in conflict sometimes. Right. One of the things I love about you is that you've thrown really your life into your passion, which is writing books, helping people, serving people. And I love that about you. I'm so thankful for your life and your ministry. Thank you. Well, this book, It's Not Supposed to Be This Way, is not a book I ever wanted to write because it's not a message I ever wanted to live. And so this really isn't, for me, just another book in a mm. long string of books. It, it, it's not just the, the message that came out because I like to write, you know? Right. Um, it was birthed from the deepest place of my heart. I, I feel like this book really is my heart spilled out onto the pages of um, what I hope will be a uh, turning point of hope in someone's life. Mm. Because the reality is we all go through disappointments um, and, and they're varying degrees. And sure. this book really runs the gamut of disappointment all the way to complete disillusionment. And what do we do? What do we do when we love the Lord and we know we're supposed to be happy, be joyful, um, you know, pick up, pick ourselves up and trust in God and sing the songs and wrap our arms around each other as we sing Kumbaya. We know all of that. Right. And I do believe as Christians, we're supposed to sing the praise songs, be joyful, sing Kumbaya, all of the stuff, right. right? But I also think there's a healthy place to process the disappointments that we all are walking through. So I pray this message is a safe place for us to process those. And obviously, we're talking about the book, It's Not Supposed to Be This, this Way, and uh, which, by the way, I just told you a minute ago, but I love the cover. Thank you, you always have the best titles and the best <laughs> covers. But I want to, and, and by the way, if you want to pick up this book, just right there underneath uh, where I'm pointing, uh, dial in that number, and we'd love to make sure you get a copy of this amazing book. But I want to talk, tell me about the story of this book. It's not supposed to be this way. Mm -hmm. How did you come to write this one? Well, all of my books start with an experience that I have, um, and usually it's something that I've already experienced, I've walked through, mm. and then the Lord has taught me a bunch of lessons. So usually my books are me reflecting back about the experiences I've had, the lessons I've learned, what God's taught me, because I feel like that'll help other people. Um, this book was different. Mm. This book was written in the messy middle place. As a matter of fact, when I first started writing this book, I didn't know how my story was going to turn out. Um, some pretty big things happened in the writing of this book. And so it is in real time. So as people are reading this, at the beginning of the book, you don't know of a certain medical diagnosis that I'm going to get. Well, I didn't either. Wow. And so as the pages unfold, it really is my real time journey with God. And when I talk about laying in bed in the middle of the night at 2 a.m., weeping, feeling like I can't quite grasp how to survive this. Mm. And my prayers were reduced to Jesus, I love you and you love me. And I would say it over and over and over. Wow. Like when you're in that place and you're writing from that place, um, the reader will be invited into the reality of how hard life can be sometimes. Right. And I don't think anybody will be able to say with this book, well, Lisa could never possibly understand the depth of pain that I'm walking through. Because I think with this book, I invite the reader into my messy middle. And... Um, but always, always pointing to the hope that we have, even in that Great. middle place, the hope that we have in Jesus. So this was the hardest book to write because it was the hardest message to live. Wow. And so you're writing this, and was there, as, as you're developing, you know, chapter by chapter, are you surprised with what came out of you? you, you are you discovering new layers? Like you said, yes. you've never experienced this before. 
the, the depth of pain. But, but, but then again, when you go through things like this, the, the depth of hope and Jesus being revealed in your life. Talk to me about what it was like to go to that dark place and find light in that dark, so to speak. Well, part of the book um, talks about a situation that I was walking through with my husband, Art. Mm. And um, in February of 2016, I found out that um, he was having an affair and it rocked me to my core. I, I, I really, I honestly can't even still now to this day, I can't even put into words what, um, what level of shock I was walking through. So um, I remember part of the journey that I had to go through uh, without knowing whether we were gonna reconcile or not. I, I needed to pursue redemption. And I think that's an important point for people to understand is that redemption and reconciliation don't have to hold hands. Mm. So reconciliation depends on another person being repentant and making choices that lead to a reconciliation. And that's what can be so frustrating when you're in the messy middle place of saying it's not supposed to be this way, but how do I get out of it? You know, it can feel like the only way to recon the only way to redemption with God is reconciliation. That's not true. You can have absolute redemption with God. You can pursue redemption with God even if the reconciliation never happens. That's one choice away. That's just saying, God, you are a redeemer and I need right. you to, to redeem me in the middle of this. And so um, I remember I was pursuing that redemption with God. And part of that was to write an impact letter to forgive my husband for what had happened. And um, with forgiveness, it's hard because there's layers to forgiveness. As Christians, we know we're supposed to forgive. Yep. But uh, for me, I could forgive the facts of what happened. That was the easier part of forgiveness. Mm. What was harder is forgiving the impact that all of that had on me. Sure. I never struggled with anxiety. And now all of a sudden I'm in a situation that I am more anxious than ever before. So I was writing this impact letter and I remember I wrote down, um, I haven't just been broken into pieces. I have been shattered. And you know, when, when brokenness happens, there's a wonderful Christian picture that we have in our brain of like picking up the broken pieces, gluing them back together and God's light can shine through that brokenness and yay, you know, sing a praise song and right, cue, right, right. cue the, the like ticker tape parade, sure, right? Sure, sure, sure. But that wasn't my story. Mm. I looked around and I didn't see broken pieces to glue back together. I saw nothing but dust. I was that shattered. Jeez. So I'm writing this letter and all of a sudden, I remember Genesis, in Genesis 2, that God, of all the ingredients in the world, He had access to everything. He chose dust to use to make His favorite creation, mankind. And so He picks up the dust and He breathes into it. And so the letter, the impact letter took a dramatic turn. And instead of me ending with how shattered I was, I ended with saying, dust doesn't signify an end. With God, wow. dust is often what must be present for a brand new to begin. Wow. And I remember those are the kind of moments that I had and that's what's recorded in this book. It's, it's, Beautiful. it's the depth of pain, but sure. also, the magnitude of the presence of God to literally take my pen and write a redemptive message and to show me how to pursue redemption and, and a redeeming quality in the midst of a story that was so brutally difficult. Wow. I, I always feel like, you know, when you face something like, and by the way, thank you for sharing your story. I feel like it's, it's going to help so many people uh, who have faced such similar circumstance. It, we all face pain, but in particular, this, this subject, when you face something like this, how, how had you led your life up to preparing your faith, your emotional stability? I mean, you're facing the brokenness, but the fact that you can even go to Genesis 2, how had you prepared your life? Not that you're preparing your life, you know, this could happen, but what, what were things you had done that you look at the book now and you look at your life now, where you're at, and you're going, thank God that I made a few decisions years before that allowed me to go through this and see redemption and see God in this. Mm -hmm. 
Well, I don't want to make it seem like, you know, I had some kind of perfect preparation for what I was walking through. But I will say this, um, the Lord has been very tender to prompt me to do things or to read something or to pray through something um, today because I get this sense that he's preparing me for something right. for tomorrow, you know? Right. So I always read God's word anticipating he's preparing me right now for something he sees coming. Sure. Um, but in January 2016, I really felt stirred to do 21 days of prayer and fasting. My daughter was about to marry a pastor, and, um, and this was that daughter, you know, that could have gone either way, like yeah, pulpit yeah. or prison. Yeah. It was a toss-up, <laughs> right? Yeah. And so um, I was so excited she was marrying a preacher. I yeah. really was so excited. You have no idea. <laughs> we believe in miracles. That's right. We do. <laughs> And so um, his church was going through 21 days of prayer and fasting. Wow. He, his dad is Pastor Chris Hodges Great. from Church of the Highlands. And so I decided to stream online uh, every morning their service, their prayer service, and join them with prayer and fasting. I was really into the prayer part. The fasting part was difficult. <laughs> right. Because I was like, how do I pursue God more when I'm hangry for 21 <laughs> days? You know, this is going to be Things don't work together, yeah. You know? um, but in, in, I just really felt this heaviness, like you yeah. are supposed to do this, Lisa. Wow. So I did 21 days and I never got the big breakthrough with God that I was kind of anticipating. Um, but then the Lord uh, really clearly that morning just spoke to my heart and said seven more days. And I was like, no, God, you don't understand. <laughs> Even the pastor stops at 21 days, right? <laughs> right, right? It's like, I can't possibly do 28 days as breaking the rules. But he said, I want you to do seven more days and pray about nothing but your marriage. Wow. And so I prayed for seven more days and fasted for seven more days of um, just really just seeking the Lord for my marriage. And um, on day 28, I pulled out my journal and as I was writing, the Lord just really was speaking to my heart in a deep place and said, Lisa, I'm about to tell you what's, uh, what's been going on. You're going to find out soon. But I need you to make me two promises. I need you to, number one, trust my timing. And number two, I need you to promise me you're going to love your husband. Wow. And I was like, absolutely, whatever it is, Lord, like sure. I will absolutely trust your timing and I will uh, love my husband. And see how tender it was that he was preparing me then mm. to make a decision because it completely changed the way I reacted about three weeks later when I found out about the affair. Wow. I always had this crazy notion of how chaotic, if something horrible like that ever happened, how chaotic I would be. Um, but the Lord had already prepared my heart for a completely different reaction because mm. I was able to look at my husband and I was able to say, this isn't who you are. I mean, in that moment of complete and utter devastation, wow. the Lord had done something in my heart to allow me to say words to him Beautiful. that were life-giving and more important um, than I ever knew. I never knew how important that reaction was. Wow, it's beautiful. Lisa Turkhurst, Lisa, thank you so much for joining us again. And you, we, we just uh, were talking about how uh, 28 days of prayer and fasting. My God. Now, it wasn't a complete fast. I do think I have to be completely honest okay. with you, right? Okay, you're helping so, me now. Okay. Yes, yes, it was not a complete fast, but it was enough to where I thought about food a lot. <laughs> and so then I would turn those thoughts into prayers. Immediately, when you say 28 days, I think of Chick-fil-A. I don't know why, but I just go there <laughs> in my mind. But 28 days and, and God prepared you. Yes. And I remember when, you know, when all of this happened, I remember calling you and you told me about the Lord had prepared you and, and, and told you those two things. So talk to me, you, you know, you, you find out, you discover, and you've been with your husband for how long? A long time. I mean, I've been with him longer than I was without him. So like my whole adult life. Right. And so this, this is revealed and, and you're feeling things you've never felt before, yep. even though you're prepared doesn't take away the emotion. That's right. And the preparation helped me have that initial response of this isn't who you are. Um, but then uh, I, I, I crawled in my bed and, and wept like I've never wept before. Wow. And I, 
I felt as if the world was caving in on me. I mean, not just, mm. not just my circumstances, but I really felt like my future. It, you know, sometimes we feel like the world is caving in on us because the present circumstance is pressing really hard, but we know in a week, a month, a year, it's gonna be better, right? Yep. This, this was not that. This was my entire future. I, I felt like in that moment, I was gonna lose my, my marriage. I was gonna lose the legacy that mm. Art and I had built with my kids. Mm. Um, I, I had so much emotional turmoil that I remember I went to my counselor and my counselor had just read this book. And um, he said to me, Lisa, your body is gonna keep the score. You've got to learn how to process this emotion. Wow. Um, and if you don't, it, it's gonna harm you physically as well as emotionally. Um, and I wanted to, I just didn't know how. I was hurting so deeply. And I kept telling my friends, I feel like my body inside, my insides are just twisted up in a knot. And, um, and little did I know that that's exactly what was physically happening on an emotional sense, but also on a physical sense Jeez. too. Because a couple of months into this journey, um, I woke up one morning, I stepped out of bed. I was in so much physical pain. I couldn't process what was happening to me. I collapsed beside my bed. My family rushed me to the hospital and I was in excruciating pain. So they admitted me to the hospital because of the pain and they started running tests and they couldn't figure out what was wrong with me. And I laid in that hospital bed, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday morning, in more pain than, than what I could even express. And I remember the doctors kept saying, we can't figure it out. And I kept saying, I know something's terribly wrong with me. Mm. And then Friday morning, a surgeon came in to the room and he said, Lisa, I ran one last test and we finally figured out what's happened. The right side of your colon has ripped away from the abdominal wall it is wrapped around the left side and it's cut the blood flow off inside of you and we've got to rush you into emergency surgery. Jeez. And he said, and by the way, I know you've been praying for God to take away that pain, but I thank God that he didn't answer that prayer because had he taken away the pain, we would have sent you home and your colon would have ruptured and you would, you would have died. And I remember as they were wheeling me back into surgery, I was having all kinds of chaotic thoughts about my situation, but the one thing that brought me so much peace is God was not a far removed God in my physical pain. Mm. I believe it probably took every bit of holy restraint for God not to answer my prayer. Wow. Because he loved me that much, because God loves us too much to answer our prayers at any other time wow. than the right time and in any other way than the right way. And that's true in a physical sense, but it's also true in an emotional sense too. Yeah. So God taught me a lot about pain in this season. So, so here, here you go, you face this emotional pain and this physical pain. Do, do you ever go to a dark place mentally? All the, all the scriptures you know, I, I ask you that with a lot of respect. You've written how many books? You're a New York Times bestseller. Uh, millions of people being ministered to through Proverbs 31. I mean, from a distance, from the outside, you are, you've got it all together. I've been to your home. Your home is immaculate. It, 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 you know, it's, Not today. But. Yeah, but, but there's no food there because of the whole fasting thing, but, but, I, but I enjoy going there. But, um, but, but did, did you ever go to a dark place? Of course I did. Of course. Talk to I me did. about that because I, I need to know. It will, it will help me personally just knowing that you also, because I think some people look at someone like you with so much success, so much going for you. And talk to me, what does that look like for you? Um, to me, it was God's promises seemed doubtful, mm. his lack of intervention hurtful, mm. and his timing questionable. Wow. And. The, those were the moments where I was like, you know, God, I feel like somehow I have fallen through the cracks of your good plan. Mm. And I think a lot of people feel that way. Absolutely. I, I, think, I think it's hard. I think those three things, you know, when his promises seem to apply to everyone else around you, you know, when they're walking in the blessing of a promise, mm and you're just in the process of a promise. Right. 
it feels unfair. Right. And when his timing is so difficult, you know, 2016 was a year of extreme highs and extreme lows. I mean, here I was walking through the most devastating situation with my husband and three of my five kids got married in 2016. Jeez. And, you know, so that when God said, you need to trust my timing, like that was a really hard, wow. it was easy in the moment, praying and fasting, like, sure. oh my God, I trust your timing until I knew what that really meant, right? right? And sitting in all those wedding ceremonies and not telling my kids, what we were going through because I didn't want to ruin their special day. So carrying it inside, Jeez. you know, it was, yeah, of course I had the darkest moments of my life. Wow. And, and when I felt like God could fix this and yet he was choosing not to, that's hard. You see, we serve a really good God. Yeah. But we also serve a really good God who does allow hurt. And that's at that point where our feelings and our faith come in conflict sometimes. Right. And that's those dark moments of the soul where I don't, I don't have a quick, easy answer for you, Chad. Sure. What, what I can say, it's in those moments where I felt my faith slipping mm. that I had to call my friends and say, help me stand on your faith yes. today. And you, you were one of those friends. We had, we had a conversation yeah. in the midst of some of my darkest times. And, right. you know, I am thankful. I'm thankful that, um, that I picked up the phone. Yeah. And I'm thankful that I had other people who could speak life back into me in those moments. But, you know, some, some moments you're going to feel like the victory is possible. And some moments... Yeah you're going to feel like a victim of your circumstances and you're not sure which way this whole thing's going to turn out. I, I, I love what you're saying because I always feel like that proverb is so true. A man that isolates himself, seeks his own desire, and rages against all wisdom. So, but most of us, when we get into a dark place, we want to hide. We want to stay in bed. We don't want to talk to anybody. But I love that you were smart enough to go, I'm, I'm going to get around people. I'm going to pick up the phone. But let me say, I did not want to do this. Sure. Let me tell you. Like, I can isolate with the best of them. You know? <laughs> let me tell you, my moments of isolation, I am not fasting. I'm eating whatever I want to eat in those moments, okay? Right. So, but I did, I did this thing, and it was so outside of my comfort zone and so not what I wanted to do but I made myself go on a pilgrimage of visiting people who I knew I could, I could stand on their fate, mm. even if it was just for a couple of days. I remember I called my friend Shelly Giglio. I went and stayed at her house for a couple of days. Wow. I called my friend Colette, went and stayed at her house wow. for a week and then another week, and then it may have even been a third week. <laughs> I, I went and visited friends in Nashville, and yeah. when I couldn't go visit people, I picked up the phone and I called them. None of those things felt comfortable, but I was blessed every single time. Wow. It was like the Lord had little gifts for me tucked inside those people wow. waiting. I just had to take that step and make the connection. I love that. And, it, you know, talk to me about, um, and I'm sure that you touch on it in the book, which I can't wait to read. Everyone's gonna read. Can I get an amen? Everyone's gonna read. Yeah, okay, I just wanna, I just, wa I'm just checking to make sure they're, they're reading the book. But at what point, and, and maybe we, you know, we're gonna go, we're gonna go to a video here in a second, but talk to me about at what point do you start to feel like, I'm gonna get through this? Hmm. Someone said to me recently, people aren't afraid of failure they're afraid of the identity of failure. It, most of us, when we get to a dark place, we think my legacy's ruined, my, my family, everything I've built. When did you start to go, I can sense, I might just get through this thing. Okay, well, there's a moment I talk about in the book. Yeah. It, and uh, I, I, the Lord was saying, Lisa, I... I, I really want you to conquer fear. But fear and anxiety, those things had gripped me in this season, like worse than what I can ever tell you. I mean, when you're waking up for 20 years in your life 
and your husband's right beside you and all of a sudden he's not beside you and you wake up at 2 a.m. and you reach across the covers and he's not there and you're reminded all over again about just the gravity of heartache in your life, you know, it's, it's painful. Sure. And fear and anxiety started to grip me. And so one day I woke up and I just felt like you've got to do one thing to conquer this. And you can't really like say, I'm going to conquer fear today, right? right? So I decided to drive to Target and buy a two-piece bathing suit, which I have to say does not line up with my biology or my theology. Thank you very much. <laughs> but... I knew I was afraid of that, and I knew I could do it today. Mm. So I drove. I got this two-piece bathing suit from Target. <laughs> I, as I was driving home, I ripped the tags off so I couldn't return it. <laughs> I went in my bedroom. I put this bathing suit on, and then I had a crisis because it wasn't putting the bathing suit on that I was so afraid of. It was turning toward the mirror and facing myself. Mm. And my scar from my surgery, and just the reality that in Genesis 2.25, one of my favorite verses, it mm. says that Adam and Eve stood there naked and unashamed. Mm. And the reason Adam and Eve could stand there naked and unashamed is because they had no other opinion to contend with but the absolute love of God himself. And that was my day wow. to say, Lisa, are you going to be able to silence all the other voices? It, it wasn't God's voice that didn't want me to turn toward the mirror. It wasn't even my own voice. It was all the voices of mm. rejection, all the voices of heartache, all the voices feeding that anxiety in me that I cannot stand here naked and unashamed. Wow. And I remember fighting those voices one by one, I would ask the Lord, bring to mind those voices of rejection. Mm -hmm. You see, rejection steals the best of who we are by reinforcing the worst that's been said to us. Mm. And so I let the Lord address every single wow. voice of rejection. And finally, after all of them had been addressed, I turned and I faced the mirror. Wow. And I stood there. Not completely naked, okay, but in my two-piece bathing suit. From Target. And then I felt so empowered, I thought, well, I'm just going to go sit by the pool. Jesus, take the wheel. He did. <laughs> and I did not walk outside. It was just a moment between me and the Lord. I packed up that two-piece bathing suit and called it my fear lesson, and I haven't put it on since, but it was quite a moment. Well, you're, you're a hero. That, for you to be able to do that, and to silence those voices and let the Lord. It's one thing for us to think, I'm going to silence these critics, but for you to let the Lord and the Holy Spirit do that, you are a hero. You said a, a, a really strong word that jumped out, and that's the word rejection. Mm -hmm. And here you are, you're facing rejection from the one that you should have the most acceptance with, your spouse, and you're going through this I mean, we all face rejection, but not, not at this rate, at this level. How did you sort that? How did you get your identity and your security, your confidence back? I think I'm still working on that. Mm. Uh, you know, what's really complicated is I wrote a book, um, Uninvited, in 2015 that um, was coming out in 2016. And so right after... I found out uh, what was going on in my marriage. Uh, that was in February of 2016. In March of 2016, my um, rough draft pages from the book uh, Uninvited came to me. And I remember just weeping and asking God, why would you have me write a book on rejection? And now I'm gonna wow. have to talk about this book that I've written on rejection. Jeez. And now I'm going to be walking through the worst rejection of my life. Like, why would you allow me to do that? And I, I felt like the Lord was just stirring in my heart. He wasn't doing this to me. He was doing this for me. Wow. You know, he had me write the book last year that I would need this year so desperately. I mean, he had me studying rejection and the biblical response to rejection and God's tenderness to us in our rejection wow. and his compassion for the rejected. He had me studying that for two years. And so 
he, he wasn't doing this to me. He was entrusting me with this. Wow. And, um, and I, I just remember spreading those pages out, weeping, weeping over the words that God had given me. And now that person I pictured that I was writing the book for, it was me. Wow. It was me. And so even in that, the Lord was so tender and so good. But I think rejection is so hard because in human relationships, we don't know what to do when someone's been rejected. If someone dies, we know how to rally around the left behind when someone dies, right? We know how to have a marked moment. We know how to celebrate what was and then help that person in grief walk toward what will be. But with rejection, there is no marked moment. There is no celebration of what was. There's just a shattering of what you thought would be. Mm. And it's, it's just so impossibly hard because that other person is still living and breathing. And, and what is the hardest, I think, is when someone dies, at least you know that they didn't want to go away and you didn't want them to go away. But in rejection, that other person may actually be happy to have walked away. Right. And that's what's so hard. Sure. And, and then how do you pick up the pieces and move on when the future you had planned no longer applies because that person's not there? Wow. It's, it's a deep grief. It's a complicated grief. And it's something that um, I think I'm still processing. Absolutely. So you face rejection and uh, you go through physical pain and... You know, I love the pilgrimage. That's so great that you go see these friends. But then you go back home and there's still nobody laying next to you in bed. That's right. And to compound that, you know, I went from having a very busy home life. And when we raised five kids, well, the last kid left home. And so now I'm facing literally an empty nest. And so it was just... It was so hard. I don't like being alone. I mean, I really don't like being alone. I like having my alone time, right. but I like for some other human to yeah, be in the vicinity yeah, that sure. if I scream, they will come and help me. Right, 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 right. right. So this was a whole nother level wow. of, um, of lonely and of um, being with the Lord in utter quiet time. You know, um, I don't think you could have chosen a better title because as you're telling the story, I'm thinking for your life, this is not supposed to go this way. This shouldn't happen to you. Maybe one, um, you know, physical pain and you have a surgery, but talk to me about when it feel. you know, the old saying, when it rains, it pours. Okay. How did you continue to um, read the Bible? Did you do that? Um, go to church, um, be around community. How did you continue to go do the things that you knew you're supposed, even though I don't want to do this stuff, I'm going to do some of these things because I know it's going to eventually bring some health and bring some life. What were some of those things besides the pilgrimage you did? And how did that start to massage some life back into you? You're in the empty nest. Nobody's there. Quiet times. The ice cream's in the freezer. (laughs) How do, you, how do you soar out of that? I'm, I'm just amazed that you're here right now with a book out of your pain. Talk to me. What did you do besides the pilgrimage? Uh, well, I filled my home with praise music. That was really important. Great. I had someone come over and help me figure out the technology side of playing music these days is ridiculous. Like when I was growing up, we put a cassette tape in, right? It was not complicated. Right. Now... It is like from your phone to the wireless speaker to the this, the that. You yeah. know, it was all kind of complicated. <laughs> but um, I had someone come over and um, I knew I had to fill the quietness with something. Right. Because um, every void demands to be filled. And wow. it's our choice what we fill it with. Mm. And so I listened to so many sermons. I mean, I even had a TV installed where my bathtub was, and someone said, that's weird. You're, like, watching preachers as you're in the bath. I'm like, they can't see me. Like, it's my problem. (laughs) I'm telling you, I filled my space up with truth. 
Um, wow. And then there were days that the space was filled with tears. Sure. And I, I didn't, I didn't want to go to church sometimes. And I, I didn't want to call a friend. You know, it's a messy process. I mean, we're, we're human. Sure. You know? But one thing, as I, as I was reading the Bible, I asked the Lord to give me some spiritual orientation with the Bible. Mm. And do you know the first two chapters of the Bible deal with the perfection of the way God designed things to be? That, that it, it perfection, when he created this world in Genesis 1 and 2, we get to see the beauty of how it was supposed to be. And then the last two chapters of the Bible, Revelation 21 and 22, perfection returns. Wow. Garden of Eden returns. There will be no more death, no more crying, no more tears, right? But all those chapters between the first two and the last two, there is no perfection. Right. And I had to make peace with that reality because I think I expected a perfection on this side of eternity that is not possible besides my relationship with God. But you know what? Walking through this journey, I am so thankful that lesser loves can never satisfy me. Wow. I'm so thankful that lesser loves will always disappoint us because my heart now knows where to turn to to get that deep satisfaction. And the gift that that's given me is tremendous mm. because I can now look at you as a human and not expect a perfection from you that would crush us in the weight of a relationship. Mm. I can look at my husband now and I cannot expect perfection from him. No husband was ever supposed to be or carry the weight of trying to be my God, right? right? Only God is supposed to do that. And so, you know, I learned a lot. I filled that void with an atmosphere of learning wow. and I needed to learn some things. Absolutely. Well, I think, you know, the void, most of us fall into the temptation of filling it with things that are immediate, substance, uh, relationship. And if you can, it is a big if, if you can bring yourself to filling it with healthy things. You know, as you were talking, I was thinking of that scripture, faith comes from hearing. And hearing from the Word of God, whether it's a bathtub or in the living room when you figure out the speaker or in your car. I know for me, when I faced the hardest times in my life, I felt the most tempted yep. to fill it with the wrong things. Did you sense some of that pulling? Absolutely. Because we don't, we don't like to feel pain. We are conditioned right. to numb the pain. Like if we have a headache, we take Advil, Right. I mean, if we're hurting, we go to the doctor and say, take away the pain, yeah. right? If um, emotionally we're hurting, you know, we want a quick fix for yeah. that. So for me, um, there were lots of, of opportunities for me to numb the pain, for sure. But I also knew that to stay in a place of just numbing the pain would never would ne I would never deal with the pain. And sure. if I never dealt with the pain, then I could never heal from the pain. The only way to get to healing is get to the dealing, right? Ooh. So you got to Say it again for it. the people in the back. Hold on. <laughs> you can't just drop, she drops these bars like it's nothing. And just, and I want to take my phone and write it down, but I don't, they don't let me have my phone up here. <laughs> say it again, my God, say that one more time. Well, the only way to get to the healing is to get to the dealing. Like Oof. you've got to deal with the pain if you're ever going to heal the pain. And dealing with it is no fun, trust no. me. And numbing it seems like the better choice at the time. Right. Um, and there's no shortage of things to numb our pain with, right? There, you know? We, we have a million distractions that sure. are eager to help us, but those distractions will never, never help us in the long term. It's so true. They only give us some relief in the short term. So true. I want to, a uh, couple of things I want to talk about. We're getting to the end, which I wish we could do this for another hour, to be honest. Um, talk to me about uh, breast cancer. Mm -hmm. Talk to me about, you know, m maybe some people are watching and going, Okay, maybe those two, you know, she sort of that, but it just kind of kept going for a while. Yeah. Talk to me about that. So in June of 2017, um, I thought Art and I were about to reconcile and that things were really turning around. 
and then the bottom fell out of our world again. Um, and some things cycled back into his life that um, I remember I wrote a blog finally telling the world what we were walking through because at that point it was either going to be shared with the rumor mill or I was going to get in front of it and right. share it with truth. And so um, I was devastated to write that I'd said to my husband, I can love you and I can forgive you, but I will not share you. Mm. And um, so that was in June. And um, at that point, I decided to take a sabbatical. So um, I spent a good long season of quiet and, um, and trying to get my bearings once again from just my world being turned upside down sure. again. And so I made a bunch of appointments um, because I don't sit still really well. Right. And so um, I just wanted to go through all the appointments you're supposed to do that I never have time to do when I'm in busy right. ministry life and everything. So one of those was to go get a mammogram. And it wasn't time for me to get a mammogram, but, um, and I'd had so many clear tests that I didn't really feel like it was necessary, but I thought it's on the list. I should just check it off and that way I won't have to go next year. Right. And um, little did I know that I would get a call back and um, for another appointment, and then I would get another call back. And then they um, requested a biopsy. And then there was a day that I sat in a very pink office in a pink chair and watched the doctors attach the word cancer to my life. And di I was diagnosed with breast cancer. And um, in kind of a crazy way, um, Art was determined he was going to walk through this with me. And um, so he was sitting right there. And I remember I pulled up a, a chair that was empty. So it was Art, myself, and the doctor. And I pulled up one more chair um, because I thought, I'm not doing this without you, Jesus. Mm. And so I just had to see that he was there too. Wow. And... Then we got in the car and I thought, well, what do you do after you get the news you have breast cancer? Like, how do, you, how do you do this? And I remember telling the Lord, like, this is too much. There's a lot of people praying for me and they're going to be really mad that this is part of this story now too. Like, I'm going to go home and write in my book about me now having breast cancer, you know. And God, they're going to be mad at you. They're going to be so mad at you. Um, but, you know, again, I mean, Wow. It's, God didn't do this to me. He didn't. This isn't the way that he designed the world to wow. be. People are not supposed to get cancer or their husband have an affair. I mean, this isn't what he designed this world to be. Sin did that to this world. Mm. Sin broke God's original design. Wow. And so in between the first two chapters of Genesis and the last two chapters of Revelation, that's God's love letter to us to say, I understand. God sees you, my friend. Mm. He sees you. He knows exactly what you're facing. That's right. He knows the depth of hurt and pain that you're walking through. As a matter of fact, some of my favorite verses are in Mark chapter 14. There are no words of Jesus I relate to more than when he's in the Garden of Gethsemane and he cries out to his father. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. God, everything is possible for you. Take this from me. That's what Jesus says to his father. And so he knows. He knows what it feels like to be walking through something that, that you feel like this is going to kill me. God, change the plan. I don't want this to be my story. And maybe you're there right now, my friend. I understand. But even more importantly, Jesus understands. And then Jesus turns it around by uttering these nine earth-shaking, hell-shattering, demon-quaking words of trusting God. And he says, yet, not what I will, but what you will. Mm. And that's the place I had to get to in this whole journey. I had to say, God, I guess if I knew what you know, maybe I could be brave enough to choose what you've chosen. Wow. But since I don't know what you know, mm. I better stay real close to you. Yes. So that you can reveal good to me that you've promised. You've promised good will come. Beautiful. And I don't see it and I don't like the way it looks right now. Right. But somehow in the heavenly realms, mm. you are shifting and arranging a good that I would choose 
If only I could have been brave enough to do it. Wow. Look in the camera, and there's people out there that maybe haven't faced the exact same thing, but they're feeling some of the things that you felt. They're facing some of those giants that seem like they can't defeat them, the, themselves. Can you encourage them, talk to them, maybe pray with them? Absolutely. Friend, I just want to speak deep into your heart right now that it will take just as much energy for you to be bitter about your circumstances as it will to ask the Lord to help you walk out this next season, trusting Him. And so I want to pray right now. I want to pray that the Lord touches the deepest places of your heart, those places that are desperate for answers, answers that may not come today, they may not come tomorrow, they may not ever come. But you can trust the one who holds every answer and his answer is good. Oh God, I pray right now that you would touch my brother, my sister, whether their circumstances are the same as mine or whether they're different, but the emotional deep hurt and pain that lingers on and on is there. Help us believe that hope is right there for us. God, give us relief from our unbelief. Help us to trust you. And God, be with us. Help us. Let us catch one glimpse, just one glimpse of evidence that you are here with us. I don't know what it will be, Lord, but if we can just catch a glimpse, just like when the woman with the issue of blood just reached out and barely touched the hem of your robe, it just is a slight touch, a slight glimpse. That's what we need, God. Will you let us see you, evidence of you being there with us and for us, and it will be enough. We love you, Lord. We trust you. And just like I prayed so many nights when I was so alone, Jesus, I love you and you love me. And that's enough. Amen.